When looking at cross sections, we might be tempted to think that thrust zones are really narrow features represented by just thin lines. And of course, these discrete zones have accumulated lots of displacement, perhaps localised earthquakes, and in the field we might expect to recognise these as narrow features upon which the rocks are highly shattered and broken. Well actually, natural thrust systems can be rather more complicated than this, so here we're going to look at the evolution of thrust zones using examples from the Chartreuse district of the subalpine chains of southeast France. We can look at the thrusts and how they relate to fold structures, and particularly how these folds host minor faults, smaller scale thrust structures, and are important damage features within the scale of the folds themselves. And we'll look at the different fault rocks these structures contain. So we're in the Chartreuse district here in southeast France. The thrust belt consists of stacked Mesozoic limestones, and these thrust systems were emergent to the Earth's surface. Deformation was occurring at around um, something like about 80 degrees centigrade. And the rocks we're going to be looking at are platform carbonates. They're grain or pack stones. They're fully cemented, as you can see on this photomicrograph, which is about three millimetres across, with all sorts of different um, sedimentary grains. Some of them are coated, but a very tight rock. And this is what these rocks can look like um, in deformed state. The dark material in here are the undeformed carbonate, and they're fractured, and these fractures are filled with reprecipitated calcite. So this one image shows us the deformation mechanisms that are in play here. There's grain breaking, cataclasis in other words, that creates the fracture network, and the fact that these fractures are sealed by synkinematic precipitates tells us that accompanying the fracture processes, there are also solution and reprecipitation processes going on, in other words, diffusional mass transfer. So let's look at the cross section that hosts the faults and other structures that we're interested in. Here's the cross section. Notice the scale. So that scale bars 1500 meters long and this scale is vertical and horizontal scales are equal and the various units are stacked up and we'll start off looking at this frontal structure here in the so-called rats anticline it's the most outlying structure in this part of the alps and here it is in outcrop let's just pick out some bedding so we can pick out the hinge of the fold structure coming around like this with a very steep forelimb and a rather gentle top of the fold and this is a tracing of this fold structure, picking out the bedding and in the boulder lines, the array of minor faults. Notice the scale again, that scale bar is five meters long. That strange loaf type shape in the middle of the sketch is the entrance to a tunnel. And let's just zoom in to the forelimb. So this scale bar is two meters and you can see that the bedding in here is shortened by a series of minor thrusts, some of which would go forwards, that's towards the west or left on this diagram, and some of which go back towards the east, so they would be back thrusts. Some of these structures appear to be folded into the steep forelimb, and others have cut the forelimb, so are still gently inclined down to the right, that's down to the east. So really quite complicated arrays of minor structures in this fold structure. It was significantly away from the major thrust which is inferred to carry this fold, as you can see in the coloured cross section in the top left. Lots of subsidiary thrusts, some predate the folding and are folded into the forelimb, some postdate the fold and cut the steep forelimb beds. Now let's turn our attention to some structures further back in the thrust belt, but not very far, only a few kilometres back in. And we're going to look at some major thrust zones in here. And here's part of this thrust zone. So let's just interpret this photograph, which is based on fieldwork on the ground. Here we go. The colours don't quite match the cross section, but what we can see is that there's this olive green unit in the sketch, which are the Ergonian, that's a Beremian aged, 
um, in other words, Cretaceous platform carbonate, which is carried up onto Upper Cretaceous rocks in here in the light blue. And caught up along the main thrust is a slice of this Ergonian platform carbonate. We're just going to look at the thrust that carries this composite sheet out onto the Upper Cretaceous. Here it is. It's a dramatic structure. This is what the Ergonian looks like away from the fault zone. And this is what it looks like in the fault zone itself. So what we've got here in the hand specimen that's been sliced open is a cemented fault breccia. These pieces consist of undeformed carbonate as well as bound together lithified fault gouge and vein material that not only seals this breccia but also found brecciated within the class within it, implying repeated cycles of brecciation, rock fracture and then cementation by the precipitation of new calcite. In the photomicrograph, which is three millimeters across, you can see this bound up tight fault gouge that dominates the image. Here's another part of this fault zone with a slice of intact material caught up along it, which is that bright white wedge. Surrounding it are these highly fractured fault gouge rocks, again seen in the photomicrograph. And again, you can see the same sorts of processes recorded here with rock fracture making a bound up rock flower, cross cut by vein arrays, in other words, refractured fault gouge that has been cemented by the precipitation of calcite. Directly adjacent to that slab of rock that's caught in the fault zone, we have foliated fault gouge. In other words, a fault gouge with a pronounced rock fabric, as you can see in this sliced hand specimen. Commonly, foliated fault gouges like this are, are thought to occur at relatively high temperatures, yet the peak temperature experienced by these rocks was considerably lower than 100 degrees centigrade. Right, so we've looked at the main fault zone in here. Now let's look at some of the other structures associated with these folds. We're going to look at the forelimb structure of this major anticline in here. This is a sketch of a road section. So here's the road section near the village of Corbel. And what it shows are panels of rocks juxtaposed by thrusts. And these panels containing their own populations of minor faults. Let's just go on a tour. So here in the Ergonian rocks, coloured up in orange, is an array of thrust faults. They thicken the bed, but are now pointing downhill, suggesting that they were formed originally when the Ergonian was gently dipping and have been tipped up along with the rest of the Ergonian package. So that they're now pointing and downward facing. So these thrusts would have formed early in the folding history. And we can contrast these behaviours with this structure here, which is a back thrust, in other words, it's the eastwardly directed thrust system, rather a nice little duplex system with those nice lenses and lozenges, which are thrust horses, back thrusts, which have cut the already steepened forelimb structure. Finally, let's look over here, and here's a fault structure that cuts the steep beds in the um, older part of the Cretaceous succession, the Valanginian limestones in here, shown with the arrow thrusting towards the west-northwest, but cutting already steepened beds. So we've got a history here that we can recognise from cross-cutting relationships and the relationships of the thrusts to the bedding and the rotations of the bedding. And we can build a story then for structural evolution that's general to these fold structures. And it works for this structure as well as the frontal structure that we started looking at. So in this series of diagrams, the Ergonian platform carbonates are represented by that tan color at the top. We know regionally that it lies on a less competent shale rich unit, which, which perhaps deforms and generates a pressure solution cleavage rather than the faults that we've been looking at so far. So the early form faults happen and presumably accommodate some kind of layer parallel shortening by which the Ergonian is thickened up intraformationally. In other words, the thrusts are restricted to lie within the Ergonian package. 
Individually, they're rather small, but there are lots of them, so collectively that might represent a significant amount of strain. Then, of course, the fold can amplify, perhaps with further intra-layer thrusting. And then, in turn, this buckle fold can be broken through as the main thrust cuts across, like this. But that's not the end of the story, because we've seen that steep beds can be cut by low angle thrusts as well, so the system can be further deformed by distributed, rather small displacement thrusts. So a complicated history of thrust localization. The structure is not simply developing by folding and then a main thrust breaking through. The fold processes also involve interformational thrusting and layer thickening. So what about the fault rocks? We've already had a look at the main thrust. The main thrust that we looked at is characterized by brecciation, grain size reduction by cataclasis, the fractures and the finer grain material are sealing up by synkinematic calcite uh, precipitates and repeated cataclastic events rebrecciate that material. The early interformational thrust, as well as the low angle later structures, have a rather different characteristic. They're characterized by synkinematic calcite fibers, such as you can see looking down on this fault zone. It's a small fault, and the calcite fibers line up parallel to the pencil that you can see on the fault plane. And this is what these fibers look like in thin section. This view is three millimeters across, and we cut across the fibre to see that the fibres have grown and they've grown in this view across the screen and the banding structure represents events of cracking and then re-precipitation, in other words crack seal deformation. Each of these little crack and slip events is significantly less than a millimetre, so really tiny increments of slip being sealed synkinematically by calcite precipitates. So the solution precipitation processes are keeping pace with fault slip. Now, solution precipitation processes are likely to be slow, certainly not seismogenic. So these types of faults are slow faults, creeping fault zones. So we have a history of high strain rate faulting in the main fault zones, preceded and post-dated by creep events. Slow strain rate, where calcite solution and reprecipitation can keep pace with fault slip. So strain rate cycles through the evolution of these structures. Overall, these fault thrust systems are modified buckles. Clearly, there's a lot of damage, fracture and solution processes that accompany the buckling processes and can continue after the main fault has broken through. So that's a brief look at the nature of the fault rocks and the evolution of these thrust zones in the Chartreuse. There's an important role of synkinematic precipitates which seal and bind up the fault rocks as they develop, even at the high strain rate, the periods between fault slip events, presumably of times when the fault rocks can become resealed so that the rock has to break again in the next high strain rate event. The other fault zones are creeping, so strain rate varies during the evolution of these structures. So a quick illustration of the processes recorded by fault rocks in the Chartreuse, and they enhance our understanding of how fault thrust complexes develop.